Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, still. Um, so I'm Adam. I'm a product manager at Credex, and we'll be covering the topic of hiring for financial technology companies. Because if uh, you're coming from a pure like tech uh, product background or a pure banking background, the experience uh, you'll find in working at a financial technology company or starting one is that the culture is very different, right? And that will impact the recruiting for your company. So um, first, I'd like to introduce Chaitra um, and Lucas. And Aditya, who is the head of engineering at Instamojo, will be joining us in just a few minutes. So to get started, maybe Chaitra, you could give a little background of your startup, Simple, as well as maybe tell us what you were doing just before uh, you had started the company. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Adam. Um, so I am the co-founder of Simple. Simple is a fintech company. We like to think of ourselves as selling peace of mind to customers. Uh, what Simple does is our model is inspired by the Kirana store Khata. So we work with online merchants to give them the capability to provide a VIP checkout experience to their best customers. And that is powered by a line of credit, which is what Simple provides. And it's an end-to-end -end platform. So we take care of the invoicing, the billing, and the settlement, everything. The idea is to eliminate friction at the point of sale and also post-purchase. Uh, my background before starting Simple was, uh, so I, by training, I'm an engineer and I also uh, got a business degree. Um, <clears throat> I worked as a software engineer long back, but it kind of feels like in my past life. Um, for the most part, after business school, which was about 10 years, 11 years ago, I've worked in uh, launching new business initiatives um, for small and mid-sized companies. So that's been my main background. I would uh, qualify myself more as a product manager um, before I started Simple. Thank you. And uh, Lucas, why don't you tell us a little bit, uh, bit about your company, Namaste Credit, sure. and your background. Thanks. Hello. Okay. So Lucas Bianchi, uh, I founded Namaste Credit, or co-founded Namaste Credit, uh, which is an online marketplace for, uh, for loans. Uh, we're very uh, focused on SME. Uh, loans and um, I think what kind of differentiates us um, is the fact that we do all kinds of SME loans. Often when people think of SME loans, they think of unsecured SME loans, but we do uh, all kinds. Um, and uh, and so we've we've developed a, a platform that speeds up the process, improves it, uh, engages uh, all kinds of different parties from the lenders uh, to channel partners to the borrowers themselves. Um, before Namaste Credit, I had uh, helped build a company called Copal Partners, uh, which, uh, which we sold to Moody's uh, ultimately. So it was a financial research and analytics outsourcing firm, not very tech oriented at all really, um, but, uh, but I helped build it uh, and bring on clients in the US as a um, head of BD uh, in the US and, and we ended up selling it um, for about $500 million to Moody's. So uh, after that, wanted to find something more exciting to do than work at Moody's for a uh, while. Um, before that, I was actually uh, an equity research analyst. So my background is in finance uh, and I'd worked at several banks before. And um, so uh, myself and my co-founder uh, actually brought the finance experience that uh, that Adam was speaking about just a minute ago. Um, and then we partnered with a CTO based here in Bangalore because this is where all the best tech is built, right? So that's it. Thanks, Lucas. And Aditya, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, so Aditya is the head of engineering at Instamojo. So maybe if you could tell us um, maybe a little bit about what you do and then maybe what you were doing just before Instamojo. I, although I know you're part of the founding team, the company, right? So please. Okay, so I'm Aditya Sengupta. I'm one of the co-founders of Instamojo. So I take care of engineering, risk, and compliance. Um, before Instamojo, I was a research fellow at IIT Bombay. Uh, which was essentially the first position I had after uh, my engineering. Uh, at Instamojo, we help small merchants accept payments on the internet. Uh, we try to make it so that they don't have to deal with banks, they don't have to deal with paperwork. Uh, if they don't need to, they don't have to deal with uh, integrations at all, right? So we try, like, so for instance, if you're a musician and you just want to sell some music online, um, you shouldn't have to set up a website, uh, host your music somewhere, then integrate with the payment gateway, talk to a bank. So the idea is that you should be able to come to us, upload your music to us, um, get a link and share that with your customers. It's as simple as that, right? 
and we try to do this for a wide range of use cases not just obviously not just files or music right so yeah the key objective is to make it easy for small merchants to accept payments on the internet great thanks Aditya. um so i'm going to follow up a question with you about how engineering at your organization is impacted by just the nature of being a payments company where you're obviously regulated right but your core product is a software product, right? Um, so if you could share a little bit about how that's impacted the way you think about recruiting at your company, as well as just sort of the, the DNA, the, the mindset of the organization when it comes to product. Yeah, so uh, an important part of being in the FinTech space is to make sure that there are certain um, attributes or aspects which you take care of very carefully, right? So for instance, security is paramount. You, if somebody enters their card number on your page, you don't want that card number to get leaked and be used by someone else. Um, you have to have a st very strong bias for correctness, right? I mean, if your bank showed you the wrong balance, you would completely lose faith in them. Um, which, and these are aspects which kind of differ from, uh, say, a very fast-moving product company. Whereas, uh, like, I mean, you really want to be able to focus on deploying things quickly. Uh, in a fast-moving product company, you'd ideally be okay with a bit of breakage, a bit of failure, whereas uh, there are many aspects of a payment company where you absolutely cannot be okay with uh, breakage and failure, right? I mean, you going down could impact somebody else's livelihood, entire livelihood, right? Um, so at the company, we focus, we silo ourselves into, like, I mean, we have several silos, so to speak, and uh, there are uh, parts of the company which... Uh, have a certain kind of DNA and there are other parts of the company which have a different DNA, right? So, for instance, our payment and uh, platform teams uh, have all these DNA attributes which I just spoke about, whereas our growth team uh, has a very different DNA, right? So, if you're setting up a landing page, if you're setting up the registration process, uh, that we are okay with like a much more fast-moving culture which where we are okay with uh, breakage once in a while. Mm -hmm. Whereas on our uh, payment work workflows, we are absolutely not okay with that, right? Uh, so, and how does that impact your release cycles? Um, so typically in a day, we do like maybe five to 10 releases. At a high level, we, are still, we still move pretty fast. Uh, what we do is we try to take the best of everything that we know of, that we are aware of as an engineering culture, and we try to amalgamate that, right? So... Um, a lot of folks in fintech are used to very large release cycles where you take a like say an extremely large feature um, you build the entire thing out get it vetted by compliance legal uh, operations and then you uh, and then you release it right there are security audits in certain industries that you have to take care of so um, there's a lot more to do to get something out to a production server in fintech typically uh, whereas in uh, like one of the best uh, workflows in product companies is that you do a very iterative release cycle where say you take like a large feature down, break it down into weekly sprints, uh, then you take small components of that and just keep deploying those to production, right? So we try to take a mix of both and uh, so we make sure that what's going out is secure. Uh, we have a very strong re peer review process. I mean, you cannot, so nobody can merge their own code in. Um, you have to get it vetted by someone else. Uh, we make sure that the people who are at least vetting the code, they have background checks, which you have to do. For instance, if you are under PCI compliance, you cannot push um, something. Like, not everyone can push stuff to uh, your servers, right? Uh, so we try to make sure that we amalgamate various best practices and get the best out of that. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I have a question for you both. Um, have you found that uh, as awareness and as people move um, from more offline activities to online in their discovery right, of products, um, and maybe, maybe your companies haven't been around long enough, but maybe you have seen a little bit of this, um, how that's impacted the culture of your organization where maybe you had more of an outbound activity initially, and now you have more of an inbound one? Right, and maybe Lucas, you can speak a little bit about this because most of your clients, right, are more offline. Is that would you, is that fair to say? Yep. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, how that's maybe impacted. So, if you're thinking about things from a business development perspective, how that's impacted the the culture of your organizations. Sure. Um, uh, so, I'd say 
our core customer set is still largely offline. Um, and what types of businesses do you work with? All kinds of SMEs. Okay. Like, Give me an example. Across the board from, you know, uh, schools, educational institutions, retailers, wholesalers of all kinds of things, okay. uh, small manufacturers, uh, et cetera. Uh, basically, okay. any company that um, that has turnover between one and 50 crores. That's kind of the core customer set. So, um, uh, so the very end customers, which are the ones getting loans through us, uh, basically are largely still offline. And, and in our space, they tend to work with intermediaries, right? Uh, have channel partners, have people that they trust and know uh, that do things for them. And that goes for loans as well as many other things, uh, right? Uh, so uh, what I've found is, especially in India, People tend to have, um, you know, other people do things for them, uh, and so that goes very much uh, in in our space. And so what we've done is uh, engaged a number of the channel partners, um, some of which are offline, but a number of which are also online, and um, and to a certain extent train them to work with us online. Um, and so that's how we have worked, kind of having champions, if you will, um, that have a broader reach out into to the broader, say, Indian community um, of businesses, uh, but that they themselves uh, are fairly adept at, um, at doing things online. Mm, okay. uh, so that's kind of been the strategy that we've deployed. We okay. continue to do that. Um, I'd say there's been maybe a minor shift of even the channel partners coming online, um, or yeah, s somewhat more significant shift in the channel partners coming online. These are people like chartered accountants, uh, right, that tend to have to do things online anyway, like file taxes for their clients, uh, like file compliance paperwork for their clients. Um, uh, and so, so that shift has been happening kind of naturally, but we have been pushing it a little more through, uh, again, kind of training them on it, um, uh, asking them to do this stuff, and, and ultimately showing them the benefit, right? Uh, when you get a big benefit out of doing something in a particular manner, then you'll continue doing it in that manner, or you'll start doing it in that manner, and then do it even more. So in our case, uh, the big benefit of uh, working online is that you're actually able to apply with many different lenders at the same time. Right. If you try to do that in an offline fashion, it's kind of impossible. Trying to approach ten different lenders at the same time is not really feasible, um, uh, and so doing it online is the benefit that the channel partners get. Basically. Okay. And so, has there been learning, you know, over the last? What, it's been about three years that since you started yeah, the company. Yeah, almost three years. Okay. And so, when you first started, and how you thought you'd go about sales, right, and what channels would would work. Um, how things had changed and how that's impacted your recruiting. So say from maybe it was more of an outbound strategy to now more of an inbound one, maybe more offline versus online. How has that affected things in your organization? Uh, well, we actually tried to push the online element with channel okay. partners from the beginning. Okay. So we actually haven't changed that element too much. Okay. Um, I'd say the type of channel partners that we've engaged has changed somewhat. Okay. Um, uh, where today we're working more with channels that were already in the loan facilitation business before, mm -hmm. and we have just trained them to do the online portion of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, before, you know, when we started, we were a little bit more focused on folks that had never done loans before type of thing. Um, and, and so that was the shift, but maybe they were really active online already doing other things. Okay. Right. So. That makes um, sense. So, okay. so there was a little bit of a behavior already uh, uh, as far as doing some activities online. That, that's, again, we started with those types of folks, but we found that um, some knowledge of the loan process is important mm. uh, okay. to set expectations with the end clients as well. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, and so, so, again, we've focused a little bit more on folks that are already in the loan business or loan facilitation business, but hadn't done anything online before as such. So okay. we've trained them to come online to do things, shown them the benefit of it, et cetera. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. And Chetra, do you have anything to share on, on this topic as far as uh, sales and marketing, how things have changed in your expectations when you were first starting the company? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe also if you could speak a little bit about a 
Is there a regulatory aspect that you have to be concerned about with your business? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yeah. So if you could share a little bit about that as well with Simple. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I think for Simple, when we started off, the nature of the business that we were in, we were planning to uh, provide credit as a convenience to our customers. So naturally, regulation was a big question mark in front of us. And uh, so for us, me and my co-founder, we had to address regulation even before we were able to raise the seed round. Right, we had to figure out a solution there. And the way we went about it was, one is, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time ourselves trying to understand what are the uh, possibilities under law, what are the do's and don'ts that are clearly defined, what is the gray area, um, and where is there room for creativity, right? So when you're trying to invent something very new, I think the whole, like for us, the entire approach was we were... We were like the entire uh, traditional payment infrastructure is a legacy of the MasterCard uh, Visa era and we thought that that needs to change, right? And the only way that will change is you have to create something new from ground up. So when you're creating something new from ground up, you're, um, there are two, there's one advantage that, you know, it's it's new, so you're reimagining the world. So you have a lot of flexibility in that sense, but you also need to operate in the real world and therefore you need to understand to some extent what are the boundaries of the actual world that you're operating in. So we spoke to, um, you know, we, we, will, we reached out to advisors, people who are experts in this space. Uh, some of you must have heard of uh, Shinjini. She used to be the CEO of uh, Paytm, uh, Payments Bank. Now she's the head of Citibank Retail in India. So she was our advisor. Uh, she, at that time, she used to work with PwC. She's ex-RBI. So we found a great mentor in her. And she really helped us figure out uh, the compliance structuring for our business. Uh, we had to do that before uh, going to, you know, even raising our seed round. Because that was the first question that was asked of us. Mm. Um, once that compliance piece was figured out, then it was about... Um, you know, going up and going ahead and setting up the team. And I guess for us, what uh, our approach to hiring where it differed, especially in the early days to now. So we are about two and a half years old now. In the early days, the most important thing for us, since we were reimagining the future, was the ability to think based on first principles. So the if you look at the first set of people that Simple hired, the first 10 people, it's that was the single most important criteria for us being able to think on first principles not being uh, blinded by how things are being able to ask why not and what else you know what what would the ideal solution be right so that was important um, and uh, of course, now things have changed, you know, two and a half years in, I guess the way things have evolved for us in the beginning, from a sales perspective, the way we were very clear that the nature of the business that we were in, going after the long tail would require a lot of feet on the street. And, um, you know, that was not the model we wanted to go after. So in that sense, we are different from um, InstaMojo, which is, um, you know, you cater more to the long tail. Uh, so we went after mid and large size merchants. So in like for almost one and a half years, our one year, our sales team was just one person. So it was the co-founders and there was one more guy. And then we added more capacity. Um, now in the last, I would say six months, we have started receiving a lot of inbound requests from the smaller merchants. And therefore now we have shifted more towards um, inbound, you know, we hired a couple of people who can take care of the inbound leads and also reach out to the smaller merchants. But our entire strategy, again, to go after the long tail is partnering with the likes of, you know, either InstaMojo, RazorPay, etc. So a channel distribution uh, through a payment gateway is what we are looking at as opposed to going and integrating with each merchant ourselves. Um, then I guess the last question that you were asking. So in, in one more thing that uh, sort of crops up in Simple's case is credit risk. Right, so we are yeah. giving we are giving people um, credit, and therefore risk is a big uh, thing. But again, there if there are any entrepreneurs in the room, the question to ask yourselves is: On day one, do you really need somebody who's a risk expert? What will that person even do when you don't even know what the set of customers who are going to adopt your service are like, how they're going to behave, etc. So if that capability exists in the founders, it's great. So my co-founder Nitya, he was ex Wall Street. He used to have a credit mortgage-backed security. Uh, background um, but of course it was in a different context in a different country however 
sir the f- fundamental vocabulary of credit and the frameworks of credit was kind of covered and we managed with that for about two and a half years however now in the last three months of course as we grow up and we scale now we definitely need somebody who's more uh, comes with experience who comes with uh, um, you know who, who can give us the clout that is required and the discipline that is required around credit so we are hiring somebody who's experienced so i guess that's just a framework to think about you know what what would uh, same same thing goes to data science you know like early on do you real when you don't even have any data what will you do with uh, unless as a founder you are an expert yourself what will you do with somebody who is like a machine learning or an ai expert right that person is most likely going to get bored yeah. so it's important to think about um i guess what your needs are early on and as they evolve you start adding capacity on that front right okay thank you and uh risk i'm sure is also very important right at in simojo is there also an element of that uh for namaste credit lucas not so much right you're not the, you're not the ones with the loan book right okay <laughs> great but maybe did the if you could speak a little bit about that um at a payments company because i don't think probably majority of folks don't realize that that's an element of you know your business model right you you end up rejecting certain merchants right so if you could share more about this activity and maybe some of the folks who are involved with that activity so yeah thank you okay so um yeah obviously risk is one of our most important uh, uh, f- one of the things we did was focus on risk from a, from a very very early point in time right because uh, for us we make Uh, a very 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 small amount of money in terms of like say if there's a hundred rupees being transacted, we make a few basis like few like a fraction of one percent, right? So a uh, hundred rupees uh, being lost implies that's like the loss of revenue on of like several um, like I think a few hundred transactions, mm. right? So one merchant going bad can wipe us out, mm. right? So for us, uh, this is something that we focus on. at a very early stage this is some feedback we had gotten from uh, i don't know if you've heard of dj patel the guy who went on to become the chief data scientist of the yeah. united states yeah. right so he pushed us to focus on risk at a very early point so one important thing about risk is that it's a function of how long you do it and how well you learn mm-hmm. right so if if you start very late you're going to get hammered by people who are uh, because if you already have a lot of money moving in you're going to get completely hammered by people who are already experienced at pulling money out of you so this is a function we started very early and uh, uh we focused on hiring from uh, companies which have a very strong focus on risk so we we hired from people like uh, paypal uh, amazon in india we hired from people like uh, flipkart so the folks we have in our risk team uh, bring in a lot of their prior experience and uh that's generally our hiring philosophy across the board uh we try to bring in people who bring in uh a lot of diversity a lot of experience mm-hmm. right and uh we largely give them a free hand and allow them to do uh like what they feel is right and yeah we're still here so we've not been wiped out so i guess right. we're lucky that way good you're you're risk aware enough right to still be here today <laughs> Um no thank you very much and um another question we have about maybe 5 more minutes here and then we'll have another 5 minutes for question and answer so um one to ask um the three of you um you know some insights maybe for oh this is included so we have about 1 minute okay great thank you <laughs> so um just quickly maybe if you could share some maybe sources for recruiting like certain industries that you found um fit well with your organization's dna my experience has been that you know we're we're a, a company that has a financial product credex but we found that our sales people um tend to the best performers are ones that come from um typically doing sales uh jobs at uh, inbound sales jobs at services companies like digital marketing services versus former bankers so i'd like to hear if if you guys can share uh some great sources some tips for the audience <laughs> um i mean we are still very small so we are like a 50% team and um, you know if 20 30 
about half of them are product and engineering. So for us, I guess the main source, uh, especially for the product development team is um, internal referrals. So I think the most powerful source has been using your own initial team and then, you know, like, uh, the use the network of the people that are already in your team starting from the founders to start hiring uh, serendipity has honestly played a very heavy role um, you know we've been lucky enough to meet especially in the early days the right types of people at uh, sort of events like this that we were randomly attending uh, and those right set of people knew and many right sets of people and we were able to hire. So I think very, very important for me personally, I would think is especially in terms of your um, engineering team is hiring the right uh, leaders. And if you hire the right leaders, um, people with the right networks, um, you know, they'll be able to bring it's like the whole queen bee model, right? If you have the queen bee, then the worker bees will kind of come. Uh, that that has been there and another thing with respect to hiring that has changed from the beginning versus now is it most functions in the early days we were focused more on generalists because when you're young you need people who can do a lot of things uh, well but I think as you get older there are certain areas um, I guess I agree with Aditya like what he was saying earlier there are certain depends on you know there are certain areas where you need uh, security correctness reliability but there are certain need certain areas where you need to be able to build fast and break things right so depending on those you know the nature of uh, uh, your evolution and your needs at any given stage specialists start becoming necessary as you grow older so I guess that's kind of how our Okay, have thanks. Changed. Can you guys maybe give like a few words answer? Because I think we'll we'll cut to a Q and A in a moment. Yeah, I'll be quick. Uh, right, basically, thanks. on the tech side, thanks, uh, it's been everything and everywhere referrals, uh, recruiters. Um, you know, just knockery kind of thing. Uh, the main thing being, you know, kind of a rigorous uh, interview process, and uh, and and folks initially. Um, uh, like you were mentioning, that uh, have a broad kind of view and vision and capability set and interest level. Um, and then as you grow, then having more specialized people. Um, on the sales side, uh, we actually haven't had a great experience with bankers either. Um, uh, and uh, uh, have also not had a great experience or done much actually with um, digital marketers, like you're saying, but rather uh, bringing in folks from a diverse set of sales backgrounds that, um, you know, basically know how to engage people and, and, and train people. Like I was mentioning before, we were in the business of training people to get online and use our platform and all that. So okay. that's been our experience on the sales side. Thank you. Um, so of all the functions we have or of all the things we do at Instamojo, I think hiring is by far the hardest by an order of magnitude, right? Um, so to add to what um, everybody else said, uh, I mean, we do all of that. Uh, our primary focus is on hiring from uh, hiring from other product companies. Uh, we tend to avoid so we tend to avoid services-based companies because we found that the DNA just doesn't like work well with us. Um, Apart from that, we, uh, I mean, from, like we look at product companies and then we try not to really pigeonhole ourselves into like certain product companies or certain types of product companies there. We try to get as much diversity as we can. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, we have room for two questions. Great. Two minutes. One question. <laughs> Just a reminder, this is a panel, so it will be recorded. These guys will be available later. If you want to have a more candid conversation, you can find them offline. Okay. Hi, I have a question for Chaitra because she mentioned that you insisted on first principles thinking when you're hiring. I think that's one of the most difficult attributes to look for in a person. Could you give an example of how you hired somebody who showed these attributes very early on in the interview process? That's a great question. You're putting me on a spot here now. Um, so I guess for me, there was, you know, I have to go back in time two and a half years. But when you 
I don't have, I did not honestly at that time have a very structured like list of questions that if I ask A, B, C and D, I'll get to know whether this person thinks first principles or not. It was, I guess the main approach I take, there are, it's twofold. One is get them to talk about the decisions that they've made in the past and ask them why they've made the decisions that they've made. And that's been my main window into ascertaining whether this person thinks based on first principles or not. And also it gives me an insight into their value systems. Right. And I think one super critical thing for us um, and probably true for any startup is you want, as uh, I think Aditya mentioned, the DNA needs to match. I guess the DNA is nothing but a reflection of the operating values that are important to you as a company and the person coming in. So asking why behind each decision, it could be changing of jobs, it could be a certain project they executed in a certain way, getting to the bottom of it has helped me. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. I think that's it, right? OK, great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, also, Chaitra, thank you so much. Lucas, thank you. Dithya, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. Pleasure.